But this weekend uh, is a weekend that I always have a part of our teaching team uh, come and speak, and that's my son, Ryan. <coughs> um, Ryan is actually part of our teaching team in that he uh, actually does, he's our team researcher. Uh, he's linguistically gifted in many languages. Uh, you realize we can't put just American culture and American eyes and the English language superimposed over the inspired word of God and think that we're going to come out with accuracy, right? Remember, the Bible can never mean what the Bible never meant. So Ryan does the hard work of, of research for us with word meanings, linguistic context, historical and cultural context, all the various things which are the lens you look through to come to a, a correct understanding of Scripture, so then the next step is you can make a correct application of Holy Scripture, okay? But seeing it correctly in context is the first step. That's the gift he brings to our team, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, he is now 30 years old. He is still, it seems eternally, uh, in school. He is just getting ready to pivot uh, in his doctoral work at Harvard University, uh, in Christian theology from coursework to his dissertation work. And so that's where he's at in the moment. And um, I am looking forward to being fed and encouraged and strengthened uh, in my spiritual journey this morning. Would you join me in extending a warm welcome to my son, Ryan? <clears throat> hey, good to see you guys. It's so awesome to be home, uh, and I mean, I like Boston, but I love California, and uh, it's nice to be, and I'm thawing out, wearing my sandals around. It's been nice. Uh, at Harvard, I find myself in something of a spiritual intellectual boot camp uh, nowadays where uh, there's all sorts of fun obstacle courses, but also some dangerous hazards, and uh, in the thick of all that, I'd really appreciate your prayers if now and then you would... Uh, remember me to God and ask him to watch over me. Uh, your prayers won't be wasted. So uh, great to see you. I, uh, at this time of year often, but at other times in the year too, have a question that goes through my head a lot. And um, it's not really a religious question at all. It's just a normal human question. I want to know, how do I live well? There's so many people huckstering different versions of that and different paths to follow, different brands of self-actualization. And I just want to know, like, well, what does it mean to be me? And maybe even a best version of me in the, in the middle of all that. What does it mean to live courageously, uh, beautifully, adventurously, all these maybe hashtag kind of descriptors that we hear? How do I live well? Am I living well? That's a question that uh, lives inside of me, and maybe sometimes you ask it too, uh, am I on the right path? And if so, how do I know? And at this time of year, it's a question that can be strong because it's an introspective moment oftentimes. We're thinking about the year just gone. We're looking towards the year ahead. And, uh, and again, it's, it's really not a Christian question. It's just a basic life question. And I'll just say right up front, if you're not a Christian and, and you're just here today uh, checking it out, that's totally cool. And uh, it's great to have you. Hopefully, we're going to talk about some things that are relevant to your life and some questions that you may be asking. And just say right up front, too, you're off the hook <laughs> for what we're going to talk about. So you just, like, chill. And if I were you, I would enjoy the sociological experiment of watching some of these crazy Christians in their native environment, you know? <laughs> like, uh, this points your neighbor, like, did, did, he, did, did he just say that they're going to wash themselves in the blood of a dead lamb? That is gross. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out my camera and take a video of this. I'm putting it on YouTube. Like, we Christians, if we say some weird stuff, you know? So uh, anyways, wherever you're coming from, uh, welcome. It's great to have you. And uh, back to this question. Uh, for those of us following Jesus who've made that decision, asking, how do I live well? That's not a free-floating question that I can just sort of answer however I want. It is actually tethered to something something we encounter often in the Bible, which is this idea of the will of God. If I ask, well, how should I live? The answer is, in the will of God. Okay, nice. But then that raises all sorts of secondary questions like, well, what is the will of God? And can I know what it is? And if so, how can I know what it is? How can I be sure that what I think I'm hearing is actually God and not some random superstition living in my head, some confirmation bias? I guess at bottom we want to know 
I want to know as a Christian, is there some sort of reliable method by which I can reliably understand the will of God? And when I ask that sort of bottom line bedrock question, I'm put in mind of a particular short passage from the Bible that ends with these words, dot, 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 so that you may know the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So that's my clue. That's a nice clue. It's claiming to uh, teach us how to approach this ambiguous, complex question about God's will. But what's important to notice is that claim comes at the end of the sentence. It's the conclusion, not the presupposition. So what we're going to try to do together is work backwards, read backwards through this fairly long sentence. It's one sentence in Greek. It's usually two in English. And uh, we're going to see if we can't learn something. It comes in the book of Romans, which is a letter written by a man named Paul. He was one of Jesus' earliest followers. He wrote it to uh, the believers who were in the city of Rome. And where we're going to read uh, comes right at a, an important hinge in the letter because Paul has just finished this soaring passage about who God is, and, but now he's turning and saying, so what? How does this apply to our lives? So um, what I'm going to do is just read the passage once, slowly through. We'll start to try to wrap our heads around it, and then I'll say a prayer, and then we'll just spend a few minutes picking it apart, idea by idea, okay? So let's pray. Or wait, let's read the passage, then let's pray. All right, Whew, that was a test. Okay, <laughs> Romans 12, one through two. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing, and then here's the phrase that caught my eye, you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now let's pray. Lord, thank you for these um, few minutes that we have together where we can set aside distractions and set aside the uh, constant noise and chatter in our life and tune in to deeper issues, deeper questions about our life and try to listen to what the scripture has to say. I just pray that you would... Uh, you yourself would be among us, Lord, and that you yourself would teach us. I pray that you would um, help me to speak with clarity and love, and uh, we ask that, that, that your will would be done here today. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's a story I like, and it goes like this. There was a guy who decided that he wants to live in a third-story residence. He'd always thought, wow, it'd be nice. I can get above the busy street, this peaceful vantage. So he goes up to a builder and says, hey, so can you build me a third-story residence? And the builder goes, yeah, I can do that. It's going to cost this much money, and it'll take eight months or so. And the guy goes, great. Yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. Let's build it. Well, about four months goes by, and the guy uh, wants to go check on the progress. So he wants to go to the building site, see how it's going. But when he gets there, he's all of a sudden really kind of confused and irritated because all he sees is a foundation and the beginnings of a first floor. So he stomps on over to the builder and says, hey, I said I want a third-story residence. What's up with this foundation and first floor? I'm not paying for that. And the builder starts to get a little bit uh, confused himself. He goes, um, sir? Yeah, so if you want a third-story residence, you're going to need a, a foundation and a first floor and a second floor, and then the third floor goes on top of that. You know that, right? Everyone knows that. And uh, that little story for me uh, is interesting because it seems to me that this idea of wanting to live in the will of God is also like wanting to live in a third story with a view. It's a tall order. And you got to build some stuff deliberately under it. you got to construct things if you're going to get up to that height. And so a few minutes ago when I read that verse, you may have noticed that there's several different moving pieces going on in there. you got to... Offer your body as a living sacrifice, whatever that means. You have to, don't be conformed to this world. You got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then finally, we get to what we're interested in, which is that you may know the will of God. So my claim or the blueprint for this sermon is going to be that all the different ideas in that verse are like the different stories in a house, in a building. You got a foundation, a first floor, a second floor, and then finally a third floor. So we'll start with the foundation, as it were, where Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
So the first thing to notice in this statement is that towards the beginning, the word therefore appears. You got to read carefully to notice these kinds of words because what that indicates is that what Paul is about to say is on the basis of what's just been said. So we are dropping into the middle of a much longer train of thought. And what Paul was just talking about uh, was the great faithfulness of God to us and his mercy for the world. So after talking about what God has done for us, Paul now pivots to what we should do for God. It, it balances out like that, you see? Here's what God does for us. Here's what we got to do for God. But now things start getting interesting because what does it mean to be faithful to God? And answering that question, Paul uses some imagery that have been very familiar to people in the ancient world, the imagery of priests offering a sacrifice in the temple. Uh, only Paul puts a really gruesome twist on it because apparently we're not just like priests offering a sacrifice we are the sacrifice itself. Offer your own bodies as a living sacrifice. So I wonder, like, am I, are we supposed to strap ourselves down on some altar somewhere and crank up the worship music really loud and then in a really radical moment of surrender just slit our own throats? Is that, is that what's going on here? Well, no, that's not what's going on. Uh, but Paul's using a radical image because he's got in mind a radical idea offering the entirety of our lives to God. Nothing held back. I mean, you don't get bargaining chips with God. You don't get to sort of negotiate over certain little mm, pet sins. I'd really like to hang on to that. Nope, it all belongs to God, and that attitude is the foundation. And you have to go deep with it because you can only build as high as you are willing to go deep into the bedrock making a foundation. And actually, it is not random that right in this uh, vein of thought, Paul mentions the idea of our bodies. I have a profound insight. I got this out of years in the library. We are animals. We have bodies like animals. All of us do, except for we are different from animals in one important way. What we do with our bodies affects our spirits. There is a dynamic uh, connection between body and spirit, and our faithfulness to God often has a bodily dimension to it. And right up front, there's good news. God wants us to thrive. Our whole person as a whole being, our body and our spirit, but in order to make that possible, we have to care for our bodies in such a way that it's possible for it and the spirit interwoven with it to thrive. And this is just basic well-being stuff, to be honest, and uh, there's a principle that runs through much of it. And the principle is, it often involves saying no to what we want in the short term in order to say yes to what we really want in the long term. So like, for example, how's your diet these days? You know? Are you, are you eating healthy foods from the whole food pyramid? Are you eating healthy portions? Not too much, not too little? That's actually part of our spiritual path, you know? Or how about exercise? How often do you sweat? How often do you get your heart rate up for like 30 minutes at a pop? <laughs> that's, part of, that's part of the path. That's part of our bodies, caring for it. How about sleep? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you going to bed at a decent hour so that you're giving yourself a chance to do that? How about Sabbath? Is there a rhythm of rest in your life? Is there a regular ceasefire to all the busyness uh, so that your being can recharge at a deep level? How about your sex life? Are you exercising self-control there and being fully loving? Are you situating that in, in the context of a loving marital commitment? All these things are bodily. They have a bodily dimension. As I said, each of them, food, exercise, sleep, rest, sex, these things uh, often require us to say no to something in the short term. But the trick is to see how that no is actually saying a deeper yes to what you really want. Because what we really want is to feel healthy and energetic and uh, well-rested and centered in love. We want to feel like we're hitting on all cylinders. And really, uh, you could think about this like a car. Let's say you have a car and it breaks down. You take the mechanic and you say, what's wrong with my car? He looks at it and says, oh, well, a belt snapped. And you say, well, yeah, but the rest of the engine's great. I take really good care of this car, so why isn't it going? And the mechanic goes, yeah, so a belt snapped. And even though it's just one small part of the car, uh, if that's not working, the whole car is not going to work. And that same principle applies to our life, I think. The whole dashboard and engine of our life may be in a good, good position, but if unhealth or 
uh, unbalanced behavior is dominating just one area of our life, the effects are going to be felt throughout the whole. Uh, but I just I want to be clear about something right here. What I'm not trying to advocate is some sort of artificial perfection in our lives. Uh, because, you know, bodies are frustrating things sometimes, huh? They misbehave. They hurt. They're annoying sometimes. That's just being human. If you're not sleeping well, it's not because you decided you don't want to sleep well. It's just because you're not sleeping well. And that's really a pain, you know? So the bigger issue that I want to emphasize is not legalistic perfection. I want to emphasize balance. Trying to see all the moving pieces in our life and trying to, to care for all of them because that's not extracurricular to our faith, actually. Caring for our physical being is, is very much part of our faith. It means offering our bodies to God. So that's, uh, that's the foundation. Now let's start framing a first story. Paul says in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world. So what does that mean? Well, Christian communities for centuries have debated just what that means, and uh, both for us as individuals and for churches. How do we as Christians relate to culture at large? And there are all sorts of configurations to this question, the way people have answered it, but I think what can happen is that the solution can often drift in the direction of a couple unhealthy extremes. On the one hand, <clears throat> Some have emphasized Jesus' model of actively going out to be with sinners. And so what they want is a church whose primary mission is deep engagement with culture. And you know what? That's a great thing, engaging with culture is. But the danger of that is the old story about the frog boiling in the kettle. You know, before you know it, they may be influencing you more than you're influencing them. And you're just going right along with them. The frog in the kettle, he doesn't know that he's boiling, but he is. So that can happen. On the other hand, some have emphasized uh, the biblical ideal of holiness, of pursuing moral purity, and, and so they want a church who's decisively detached from culture, sort of sanitize it from the sinful germs out there. And you know what? Pursuing holiness is also really an important part of the Christian path. But if that's the only emphasis, then our lives and our churches, we can become like a judgmental ghetto, you know? And we totally forget about our mission about being a light to the world. So I think, again, what the charter here is for balance, or what we may call like a soft difference. Because there is difference. When you sign up to be a Christian, you're signing up to be part of a counterculture. It's always been that way. The world wants to squeeze us into a particular shape, and we say, no, not going to do it. But the border between the church and the world of Christian and culture or whatever, it's not a barbed wire fence with guard towers and machine guns. It's not, not like that. The border is, it's a, an open and courageous invitation to join us in a new way of being human. And, but in order to achieve that balance, we need the Spirit's daily help, the Spirit's daily guidance to teach us how to do that. And when we're talking about the Spirit, it's important to notice, the Spirit has an adjective attached. And it's not the, the nice Spirit, it's not the fun Spirit, it's not the good vibe Spirit, it is the Holy Spirit. That's not an arbitrary word. The Holy Spirit. So if we want the Spirit to empower us to wisely engage with culture, then we have to ourselves embrace the path of holiness in our life. And as I've been thinking about the interaction between Christians and, and culture, uh, one idea I recently encountered has been helpful to orient myself. I want to share it with you. Um, when I encounter something that as a Christian, I have to say, well, I think that's sinful. Uh, I think the right thing to say is this. They are not my enemy. They are the victim of our enemy. And I want to say that again because this has been a paradigm shift for me. Very helpful. They're not my enemy. They're the victim of our enemy. Because I think that's the deeper reality of what's going on. Because sin, sin is something that dehumanizes us. It robs us of some of the best parts of life. So when encountering someone embracing a dehumanizing practice, the response isn't to condemn them. The response is to uh, see them as the victim of a lie. And I want to speak for a moment about one lie in particular that uh, in my generation anyways, like 20-somethings, 30-somethings, uh, is really gobbling up a lot of lives. And it, it has to do with sex. And actually, it's not just one lie. It's two lies at two extremes. Uh, the first lie goes like this. Sex is something dangerous. It is sinful and rather disgusting. 
So best to keep far away from it or, you know, at least cover it up. That's, that's a lie. That's the lie of fundamentalism. And it dehumanizes us. It's not true, but there's another lie on the other side that it goes like this. Sex is the epitome of who you are. It is the apex of self-expression. It's a fundamental right in your personhood. And anybody who tells you otherwise is an oppressive bigot. Well, that's also a lie. That's a lie of the world. And it's also going to dehumanize us. And you know what's really tragic to me? Is that both of these lies we sometimes hear in churches of different stripes. Both lies. That sex is gross or that sex is like a god. Both of these sometimes are stamped with the name of Jesus Christ. And I think that's wrong. I don't think that should be. Here's the truth. And once again, uh, it's a matter of balance. Sex isn't gross, but it's not a god either. It's a gift. It's a beautiful, intrinsic part of our personhood. And like all precious gifts, it comes with a few guidelines and instructions, you know? You can think about like fire. You can do some really awesome, fun, useful stuff with fire. Or you can burn your house down. So maybe read the manual, you know, before you start doing stuff. You know, read the instructions first, or you might burn your world down. And the upshot for me of all this sex stuff is something that Jesus said. He says, the truth will set you free. The truth's going to set you free. So don't live in lies. Live in the truth. Don't be squeezed into a shape dictated by the world. Be free in the shape that he has for you. And the shape in this regard that he has uh, is a freedom that's just a a robust and wonderful sex life within uh, the context of a loving marriage. As Christians, just to be clear, sex outside of marriage in any form is just not an option for us. It's certainly a hard path, but it's just not an option for us. That's the deal. And, um, but I I do want to emphasize also that this ain't easy stuff. Getting sex right nowadays is really hard. And I'm right there with you. And when, when mistakes are made, there's forgiveness, there's healing, there's restoration. But it is the case that our, our sex is at the center of our physical beings, and the center belongs to God. We don't get to keep the center for ourselves. The center belongs to God. So, uh, okay, so that finishes the first story. We're getting up higher now. We're moving to the second story. Uh, this is what Paul writes in the continuation. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So what's that all about? Uh, well, at first pass, I think it's already throwing us something counterintuitive because I don't know about you, when I think about transformation, I think about it as something that happens to us. You know, well, what am I doing? Well, you know, I'm just, I'm just waiting around to be transformed here, brother. You know? <laughs> any day, now, any year now, I'm going to be transformed. I don't know, but God's going to do it. Suddenly, glitter's going to fill the atmosphere. I'm going to pop awake into my best and true self, and I'm, it's just a matter of time. You know, uh, it's fun to make fun of, but there's actually a certain dimension of truth in, in that, which is called resurrection. As Christians, we believe that one day God is going to transform the world, our bodies with it, and uh, he's going to make all things new. And so there is a sense in which transformation does happen to us. But in the meantime, apparently, from this verse, we're supposed to get to work transforming ourselves. And it has something to do with our mind in particular. Uh, so if I can talk about my own life for a few minutes. Um, in the past couple years, this verse, this clause in particular, has been a big learning curve for me. And uh, my job as a doctoral student is to exercise my mind. That's how I earn a paycheck. But uh, while one little corner of my mind is filling up with a lot of facts and knowledge and stuff, I've had to come to grips with the reality that much of the rest of my mind is filled with a lot of chaos and garbage, and I I don't know how to fix it. And, uh, I mean, I'm all on board to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Like, yeah, it sounds fun. I want to do it. But, A, I don't know what that means. B, I really don't know how to do it. And, C, in the meantime, my mental experience is very painful. And um, without going into too much detail, just mention I went through a very uh, difficult breakup uh, some time ago, and... Also was just trying to like stay above water in this fire hose of ideas that is Harvard and uh, ideas that fundamentally ignore God or fundamentally reject God. And it just, it, it wasn't going very well. It was, it was very tough and uh, it's a long story and maybe uh, I'll tell it some other time. But a few years ago when I preached, I, I told the story about uh, breaking my neck 
when I was 20 years old and the process of that pain and recovery. And But I can honestly say now at 30 uh, that in my experience, pain in the mind and pain in the heart is is much more severe than pain in the body. And um, But in the process, what I've discovered is that Jesus is in the business of healing minds and healing hearts. He does that. And the first level of the healing is just Jesus himself. It's not like new ideas about Jesus, new perspectives on the words of Jesus. No, it's just Jesus himself, knowing him and being known by him, being in a relationship, reading his word. That is the first step of this transformation. And, uh, but as it's progressed, there's been more wrinkles in it, unexpected wrinkles. And one of the things that I've realized is that, yeah, God wants to heal us, but sometimes he'll do this through divine intervention and sometimes through what we might call divine process. Like it can happen in a flash, bam, change, breakthrough, that happens. But sometimes healing unfolds much more slowly over a period of months and years. And for me, this process of trying to like be transformed by the renewing of the mind, uh, it has been of this latter, slower type. And one of the most important elements of this process for me has been actually learning about what the mind is. You know, we got, a, we got an organ in there, <laughs> you know? Like what is going on under the bone in here? That's, that, that is an important question. And the model I've arrived to, not surprisingly, has to do with balance. Some people want to make it like 100% about clinical psychology. Some people want to make it 100% about spiritual warfare. I'm not convinced by either of those people. I actually think it's, it's a balance because both are in play. I think the fact of the matter is, is that we do have an enemy in our scientific, scientism culture. Uh, sometimes that sounds like a ludicrous idea. It's not. That's another sermon. Uh, it's not. We do have an enemy, a spiritual enemy, and he uses psychological tools. But here's the good news. We have a savior. And not only does he also have psychological tools, he invented the brain. So we're, we're, in, a pretty good, we're in a pretty good place. And uh, I'd like to do a little bit of show and tell if I can. Uh, share with you a few books that have been helpful to try to th think about a balanced approach to the mind. You may want to jot these down, actually, if they'd be helpful to you. Um, this first book is called Switch On Your Brain. That's a catchy title. Uh, it's by a woman named Caroline Leaf. She's a doctor. She works in neuroscience. And this book is a great introduction, very exciting, to the actual science of our brain. What's going on in there neurologically uh, at, at many different levels? Great book. Uh, second book I'd like to recommend is uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters. And uh, the premise of this book is interesting. It is a senior demon writing letters to his nephew, a junior demon, on how best to corrupt a human being. And this book is a profound primer on the spiritual war that's going on around us and in us. Very much recommend this book. And then the third book is this. Uh, it's called Into the Silent Land. I took the jacket off. It's called Into the Silent Land, a Guide to the Christian Practice of Meditation. It's by a monk named Martin Laird. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you know, <clears throat> sometimes uh, when Christians, when we hear words like contemplation or meditation, we get a little bit skittish because we're like, oh, well, I mean, the religions of the East, they have copyright on that stuff, so we better stay away from it. Uh, actually, that's historically not the case. For many, many centuries, Christians have worked with the breath have worked with meditation and contemplation. And this book I found to be a great guide into some of those deeper, quieter dimensions, not only of our own mind, but of prayer. And so anyways, these three books, they're all, uh, they're very readable, fairly short, and taken together, I think they uh, provide the, the touchstones for thinking uh, in a balanced way about uh, our psychological, spiritual reality. And actually, there's a fourth thing I want to mention here because it's, in this process, proven very invaluable to me, and that is seeing a Christian counselor on a regular basis. And honestly, for type A people like myself, uh, that is a tough pill to swallow because I do not like to think of myself as a guy who needs help. It's not me. But you know what? We do. I need help. We need help. And I, that's just the basic teaching of the Bible is that we need each other. And we, also, we all need a place in life where we can be vulnerable, 100% honest about the ugly parts of our lives. Because if we get to a place in our life where there's no guidance, there's no accountability, that is a very spiritually dangerous place to be. And one of the things I've discovered in this process is that, you know, we're not as alone as we think we are. 
we probably all have some issue or wound that is festering or some long-term habit that we, or, you know, tendency pattern that we have got to tend to. Could be hurt from a past or even a current relationship. Uh, could be anger issues. Could be a compulsion or addiction of some variety. Could be anxiety. Could be depression. Any number of things. We've all got one. And, you know, I think the Lone Ranger approach to dealing with it is not the way to go. The Lone Ranger approach, actually, I, it, it markets itself as being strong. I don't think it's strong. I think it's weak because I think true strength is approaching another human being and asking them to help you. Uh, my, my counselor, his name is Eric. He's an elderly Christian man, uh, lives near my school. He has helped me to pinpoint so many blind spots and undeveloped places in my own life. I, I could not do it without him. I'm so thankful. And um, if you explore having a, a, a Christian counselor, a psychologist in your life, I would strongly recommend, very strongly recommend that you find someone who's a Christian. And the reason is, is that you both know then a priori that what the counselor is helping you do is to, to pinpoint and identify places that, that need work, but that healing ultimately comes from God. God is our healer, not psychology. And so the counselor can help to uh, facilitate that process. And uh, so to close this section about being transformed by the renewal of the mind, let me just say, as Christians, we are called to consciousness. We are called to be awake and alive, not to be shuffling along through a fog of confused emotions and half-baked ideas, you know, still licking wounds from years and years ago. No, we're called to be awake and alive. And Christianity, Jesus, the Bible, that's the first step. It's a radical new lens to see ourselves, to understand ourselves. But even after we're baptized, there's still a lot of work to do. It doesn't just happen. You gotta work at it. You gotta choose on a daily basis to embrace mental, spiritual patterns that are mature, that are gonna grow you up in your mind. I mean, from what Paul is saying here in Romans, it seems this isn't just like a take it or leave it kind of thing. It seems like being transformed in your mind is an essential part of living into the fullness of what God has for you to do. And so uh, now we're there. We've made it to the top. We're, gonna, we're, we're at the third, uh, the third level, the third story. And like every good tale, I think that this one also has a surprise ending. Because listen how Paul actually finishes the sentence we've been studying. So that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. But the key phrase that I think is surprising is this, that by testing, you may discern God's will. Because, like, what? Even after we've done all this, offered our bodies, resisted the world, transformed our mind, are you telling me there's still a process of testing, of trial and error, of thinking it through? Yes, is the answer. At no point does God or the Bible ever become like this bubblegum machine. You just put your coins in and turn it the right way, and then bloop, out comes your answer. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. But there's a silver lining. There is uh, something very positive here. Although the Bible does not give us a one, two, three formula for making wise decisions in the ambiguities of life, it doesn't, what it will do is shape us into the kind of people who make decisions that are wise. I want to say that again because this has also been a paradigm shift for me. While the Bible doesn't give us a one, two, three formula for making wise decisions in the ambiguities of life, what it will do is shape us into the kind of people who make wise decisions. Wisdom is not just about getting the right answer. Wisdom is about who you are. And it involves our whole person, our body, and our mind. We got to all be engaged. And why do we have to be so engaged? You know why? Because God doesn't want puppets. He doesn't want you to be puppets. He wants you to be people. He wants you to be fully alive people. And to do that, it means it's a partnership between his grace and his activity, but our own effort, our own ideas, our own action. But then at this point, if you're cynical a little bit like me, you may be asking, wait a minute. If after all that, God's will still isn't clear, we still have to work it out. What is the point of all those disciplines? Is this, is this some sort of like bait and switch? What's going on? Well, I'll tell you what I think is what's going on. As humans, we can be pretty good at convincing ourselves that just about anything is the will of God. You know that? <laughs> We're good at persuading ourselves that all sorts of bizarre and sinful things are really God's will. 
He's really pleased with us. So the point of all these disciplines then is to act as a safeguard against self-deception. That's the point. They teach us patterns of freedom and patterns of holiness so that when we're actually trying to figure out God's will in a big decision moment in life, we're not gonna gravitate towards errors. We're not gonna gravitate towards things that contradict true freedom and holiness. And also, by the way, the purpose of framing so many of these things as a matter of balance, we've talked about balance a lot, uh, that's also to uh, prevent the error of overcorrection. We can overcorrect this way and be extreme in that way. Balance is where it's at. Patterns of discipline is where it's at. And there's also one other thing that's very important in this whole process, which is joy. Because this isn't a grim climb. Don't frame it like that. I got my bloody knees. I'm crawling up the mountain. That's, that's not what it is. This is an exciting adventure with the resurrected one. So joy should suffuse this whole process for us. And uh, just to close, I'd like to challenge you with an action step. And this is for people who are believers and also people who are not sure about this whole thing. I would challenge you sometime in the week ahead, first week of the new year, why don't you open up to a friend or a family member about what's really going on inside and maybe what you're struggling with and, and where you want to grow in the year ahead and where you're confused. And uh, just be 100% honest. Lay it all out there. Uh, there's a great theologian once who said, uh, also known as my dad, who said, uh, we're only as sick as our secrets. <laughs> we're only as sick as our secrets. So do yourself a favor. Take a risk and make a jailbreak from your secrets prison and, and, and get the ball rolling uh, in this new year towards becoming a little bit more awake and a little bit more alive. And, and if you're a believer, by the way, you could do something more than talking to a friend. You could talk to God. Prayer is where it's at, I'm telling you. It's when we stand on the threshold between earth and heaven and talk to God about what you're struggling with, what you're confused by, where you want to grow in the year ahead, where the friction points are, because you know he wants to help you. He loves you so much. And maybe his answer will be divine intervention. Maybe it'll be a divine process. It'll be long, but it's no less divine. It's no less transformative because he wants that for you. He wants you to become fully alive and I mean, at the end of the day, this Christianity business, it's not at all about becoming more and more religious. That's a dead end. It's about becoming more and more human, about becoming fully, finally human. And the God who became human, Jesus Christ, he's the one to teach us how to do that. Amen? Amen. Thanks, guys. So you beautiful people, God's love letter to us this last time of this whole year, I read to you one more time. Therefore, I urge you, the apostle Paul writes, you beautiful people, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Before I take privilege to lead in prayer, I am certain that some of you are ready this morning to begin your journey with God, to begin your relationship of actually knowing God. And if that's you, I would love to pray with you right now. I won't embarrass you, but I would love to pray for you. If that's you, I want to include you in prayer right now. Would you raise your hand high? Hold it up all over the house. That's right. Just put them up. You truly want to surrender your life to Christ. Yes, yes, yes. Just put your hands up if that's you. Yes, yes. Just put your hands up. Keep them up and hold them up for just a minute. Yes, yes, yes. Anybody else? Yes, yes, yes. Father God, I thank you for what you're doing. You never fail us. Your word never returns void. It always accomplishes uh, spiritual work and, and gain in our lives, and it's happening again right now. 
God, these are some beautiful men and women who are raising their hands right now saying, God, come into my life and forgive me of all my sin. Be my Savior. Wash me clean. Let what you promised in your word come true in me. That if any man or woman is in Christ, they have become a brand new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. May that be true for the many people whose hands are raised in the house right now. Thank you, God, for once again performing the work of spiritual transformation. What was dead is now alive forevermore. In Jesus' name. And everyone said,